a laser coming out that's looking for something. And yeah. so they know the facility infrastructure. So they know the columns, the racks and the, the permanent infrastructure. But when they see something that is not permanent, something that's not in their brain, they then, per ANSI regulations, need to have the proper distance to engage their brakes to come to a controlled stop. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now, here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. Robotic applications have come a long way. They can automate a lot of mundane processes in your warehouse and facility. But to get the ROI from robotic investments, you need to assess the factors that make robotic applications efficient. Just like human operators, robots are not suitable for all environments. Even minor changes in the environment can impact their efficiency goals. With any technology, the more standardized and streamlined your processes are, the higher your chances of success with your technological investments. In today's episode, we have our guest, Kevin Paramore, who discusses the nuances of robotic automation of warehouse and manufacturing processes. He also touches on barriers to automation and shares several stories where robotic automation may not be the best fit. Finally, he provides insights into technological, environmental, and regulatory factors to explain the use cases for warehouse robotic applications. Let me introduce Kevin to you. Kevin has nearly 20 years of experience in the supply chain industry, including over six years with Yale as part of the emerging technology team. His current role includes matching customers with best fit technologies like telematics, motive power, and robotics. Quoted in several trade publications on robotics and has a guest article on a practical approach to robotics implementation published in the annual Robot Almanac from the Future Institute. With that, let's get to the conversation. Hey, Kevin. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Sam. Of course, my pleasure. And I'm super excited to have you as well, especially the folks who come from the warehouse and mobility background. They have tons and tons of stories that are going to be so exciting for our listeners. Just to get things off, do you want to start with your personal story and your current focus, Kevin? Sure, sure. So uh, I've been in the industry for roughly 20 years around distribution, retail. I've, I've been in uh, now, obviously, in material handling. Yeah, I I am the Emerging Technology Commercialization Manager for the Yale Materials Handling so Ooh. Corporation. So very long title and uh, go fairly deep into mode of power, into telematics and big data. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 you know, robotics obviously is a great piece of that. Yeah. Yeah. So so basically my my role with Yale is to kind of kind of like a matchmaker. Right. So I take these large companies, I, I go through their struggles and pains and try to offer solutions that fit best. And some of those can combine some of those topics that I, I, I mentioned, and some can really uh, call for a singular action or a singular, singular solution, uh, such as telematics or robotics or single power source to, to bring their mode of power uh, and their material handling equipment up to speed. 
Okay, amazing. And we would love to dig deeper into all of that. What is uh, how they are going to be relevant for the manufacturers and the retailers? Some of our listeners may not be familiar with these terms and how they may be applicable for these guys. It's going to be super beneficial. But before we do that, we have one of the standard questions that we ask every single guest, Kevin, and that is going to be your perspective on business growth. Right. So my perspective on business growth really is going to kind of resonate around the distribution model has has changed drastically. I mean, it's changing drastically every day, but really heightened when COVID sunk in. Um, Everybody stopped going onto the retail fronts and really uh, focused more on online shopping, which then kind of created havoc amongst the distribution centers. Yep. So really, I think that growth is that took place naturally. And my perspective is it's here to stay or even heighten further. So the pressures on the supply chain, the pressures on, uh, you know, same day, next day delivery, all these things are uh, there's a lot of pressure amongst various companies out there today. And we're here to help. OK, love that perspective. And you are so right that, you know, there is a t- tremendous pressure overall on the supply chain because of COVID, just because the consumer behavior has significantly changed and that changes everything from the supply chain perspective. So just to put things in, in perspective, Kevin, if there is a way to start with a story where you have seen the traditional distribution model and that actually got flipped upside down, because of COVID and let's say if you did any work related to automation just to overcome some of that. Sure, um, I'll come up, I've got a couple of stories I can share. One, okay. one is in auto manufacturing. Okay. Um, so, so in auto manufacturing, there's a lot of uh, sequencing and other tasks that are being completed you know, every day. Okay. And, and when, when you go in and look at an application and look at various uh, tasks that are being done, yeah, uh, a lot of those are done manually. So somebody's yeah. on a tow tractor pulling carts of raw goods or, or various parts. And so in this specific situation that I was in or application I was observing, they actually once COVID had come in, they yeah. basically had to shut down a complete line due to exposure and their employees not coming into work. OK, so, so and that was company policy. Uh, yeah. on, and but literally caused their production facility to halt. Yeah, um, that affects a lot of people, right? That affect not not only the people that have COVID, and I'm not trying to harp on that, but I mean that that's obviously mm-hmm. a bad situation. But in the production line, it, it kind of halted financials. It halted other areas, so other yeah. people that were bringing various parts all manually. That that kind of uh, brought it to a crippling stop. So in, in companies that that brings up that, you know, on cartoons and, and other movies, you see that red light, that strobe light that goes off. You know, that, that's just, yeah. it's kind of fictional, but not really. Yeah. You, yeah. When that when that took place, that red strobe goes off and now yeah. you're in crisis mode because it's costing the company gobs of money. And now you're creating that uh, shortage of vehicles going out to the dealerships. Yeah. You're yeah. creating a pent up demand. And, and and so all those things kind of uh, trickle into a bigger, bigger problem. That's on the auto manufacturing side. And, and what we were there to offer was a, uh, a automated uh, tow tractor that can pull multiple carts. It can auto charge. It can auto hitch, auto unhitch. Um, it it kind of brings a lot of brains into that application. It, it's not rocket science. I mean, basically, the carts are lined up and you pull the carts uh, sometimes in auto in sequencing, you're probably very familiar with it, but they're taking it down a long hallway or a tunnel into yeah. the manufacturing facility and uh, that can be either done by the three P you know, some other three PO or, or provider. And so, so that it's not rocket science. You're pulling a sled essentially yeah. into a uh, production facility. So we basically eliminated the need for personnel to drive these, these tow tractors through that tunnel and, and kind of automated that whole process. So uh, I think the, the customer was relieved to have a solution like that yeah. and something that was smart enough to, to accommodate that, that process. I think in, the ret- in going into retail distribution, as you can imagine, uh, if, if you're traveling anywhere in the U.S. today, you're seeing banners hung over the side of warehouses. You're seeing everything online. All the, the, They're looking for help. And I won't get into the political reasons, but basically there, there is a dra- there's a drastic shortage of 
uh, operators today, and, and, and yep. for, for that matter, waitresses and other things across multiple industries. So in the distribution areas, seems like a fairly used to be the, the job market pre-COVID was what around flirting just over 3% of unemployment. Yeah. Um, so, so it was more of a tight market, a very tight market. When COVID hit, th- there was kind of a bit of an uncertainty and then uh, people were sent home. And then when retail distribution kind of spiked, they could not get people back for many, many, many different reasons. So you had a lot yeah. of absenteeism, you had people not showing up for other reasons. And so that is that was the major, in, in, some, in some big retail distributions, that was the major calling or, or hand-raised red flag that indicated they need to go to uh, look for robotic systems or some type of automated solution. Yeah, so very interesting story. So one of the things that I would like to mention is obviously COVID was a real deal and it has had a lot of disruptions overall on the supply chain. And it seems that it it may probably stay there for a year. Uh, I don't know, you know, when that is going to be done, right? But I mean, uh, we cannot plan our supply chain purely based on COVID. But because of COVID, the consumer behavior is definitely going to change a lot. And as you correctly pointed out, that that is actually putting a lot of pressure uh, overall on the supply chain. But the labor market, the way you described, I think that's uh, that's that's completely di- different. But it's related as well because you know the labor shortage was there before COVID. It it became slightly more prominent, and it's probably going to become more prominent in the future. So we need to do something, and this is the conversation that I have had with a lot of different manufacturers and distributors. So I don't know why the manufacturers or distributors they are not really adopting the automation technologies. So in your experience, is it purely fear or is it purely education? What has been your experience overall? when they are looking at these technologies and why are they not really automating when there could be a real replacement the way you described in your story? Sure. So so I think there's a lot of diff- various answers to that. I think uh, yeah. really you've got rising wages. So okay. uh, e- even the labor that's showing up, you've got somewhat of the Amazon effect or other things that are creating the $15, $16 and bumping up these nickel dimes quarter raises that are causing people to shift from Uh, distribution center A to distribution center B very quickly. So there's instability. So even when people return, the the churn rate is very high. So what what robotics offers to that is you have, let's say you have, I'm just making up raw numbers, you have 100 positions. And and we can't automate the entire facility. I want to make sure that um, that's not the point. Uh, the, The point is really looking at what are the easy point A to point B tasks that are being done, trash retrieval, milk runs, I- anything that's being done, as well as even a little more complex, like uh, if somebody's unloading a truck and it goes yeah. into a staging area and then gets put away, you know, we, we have systems that can go up to 30 feet in the air and put away in a very consistent manner. So in the consumer's good market and other things, that, that's what we're accomplishing, not just your basic uh, skill level operator, but we're actually going, you know, a, a step or two ahead of that. And, and that's what I think there's, there's fear and anxiety amongst various procurement areas. And, and because typically these, these, it, these customers have various roles, right? So they have, obviously they have procurement, they have engineers that are within their facility, they have yeah. safety, they have safety in their facility, they have sustainability in their facility. I mean, a lot of these company, large corporations have all these positions and it's really getting them all together to understand all the various benefits of a robotic solution. So, so I think that's just one piece of it, right? Um, I think two, robots typically operate by rules of the highway. So, and mm-hmm. I'm using that in a term of the warehouse. So there's various standards, ANSI standards and other regulations that control the speed of the robot, the engagement of the pallet or engagement of the cart. What happens when a when a, a person or object comes into play? You have to have certain braking distance. I mean, there's a there's a lot of safety built into these uh, systems. Yeah. So so really, from the you know the aspect of the lens of the safety person at the site, you know that's their number. They stand in front of their operators every day. Safety is number one, right? Here are the things we're doing. Here are the initiatives we're taking place. You know, robots kind of they they don't make those aggressive driving mistakes. They are controlled by uh, many techno- redundant technologies to help them stop at every stop sign, 
turn their blinkers on, you know, all, the, all those things that we yeah, as human, yeah. Uh, yeah. we, we kind of create some problems in that space. Yeah. So interesting perspective. And from my experience, as you know, Kevin, we are in the technology space as well. We are more into the software, but it does not matter whether we are selling uh, the hardware technology or the software technology. From my experience, the challenge always is going to be in the implementation. So when I am actually having the conversation with my customers, it's not that they don't understand the benefits that any of the technologies, such as robotics, are going to offer, they understand the benefits. They also understand where this could be automated. But typically, the reason why they don't want to get into any of the technologies is either they have had prior experiences, and because of that, it did not work out, or there is a fundamental assumption in terms of what preparedness we need to have overall in our infrastructure before I can implement any robotics. For example, in, uh, in your conversation, the, the, some of the comments that you mentioned were related to, let's say, if you are doing directed put away. So my assumption is going to be that your assumption is that they have some sort of WMS system and the discoordination is going to be inside the system so that a robot uh, can communicate. I don't know if there are going to be any sort of pre-assumptions before these technologies can be implemented or can any manufacturer distributor out there, they can just pick a robot, put it in a process, put the power button and it's going to work magically? That's right. <laughs> can you tell yeah, I'd love to elaborate on that a little bit. So so yeah. really, there's multiple steps in our process. Um, yeah. so, so to your point, yes, when we, when we speak about this, uh, we're, we're in a fairy tale land when we talk about, yeah. you know, just putting a robot in and it, you <laughs> hit the power button and it goes. Yeah. Uh, typically in our process, what, what our business development team does is, yes, they're creating a uh, interest within that process. But yeah. what we'd like to do is validate a lot of parameters, right? What is the, I think the major point is it's really not complex. If you look yeah. at it from a high level, you're, you're trying to do what humans are doing and you're trying to see if a robot can do it at that pace or greater and eliminate other risk. Yeah. And so that, that that's really the question you have. And then, then you go through a, a whole slew of checklist questions, right? What are the aisle widths? What are the height? What are the putaways? What type of pallets do they use? I mean, there, there's gobs of validation questions. Yeah. I think from a commissioning standpoint, we typically go out and we do what's called, we call it an engineering study. Yeah. So we're going to go out and, and dot our I's, cross our T's because we're, we're not just a robotic company. We are in the yeah. complete material handling business. So yeah. the, the the care of the, the taking care of the customers number one because and at the end of the day that's that's you know as the OEM or as as the man, you know manufacturer of a, a robot your names on that you're you're you have to hit those desired throughputs that are in the contractual agreement before you get a, a, a final commitment or pay, paid on that unit yeah so so really it does take the due diligence it is not a fast process. Um, when, when you get into the customer, so once you have a signed agreement, you have desired throughputs, you have the right robots there, the right integrations with the WMS system, like you mentioned, at, at that point, it is, it is then validating to those desired throughputs. Uh, you know, pr typically, they have a percentage agreement where uh, what is the percent of, you can call them missions or tasks that are completed with no errors. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and so all these things come into play. So commissioning can be on simple tasks, can be, you know, milk runs or basic racetrack things could be probably done in a day or two. Yeah. Uh, but, but then you have these larger integrations that uh, could, could take months to, to complete that integration. Okay, amazing. So just to put things in, in the perspective for, let's say, our listeners, do you have an example of a story where, let's say, Based on your your due diligence, you are going to say that, no, 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 this is definitely a good fit. And we really want to, uh, you know, we can really improve the processes uh, in this specific facility. And there's going to be a facility number two. And you did your due diligence and then you figured out, you know what, this is going to be a terrible idea. I don't want to get into this engagement because I'm probably going to get a bad name out of it. Right. Sure. So can you offer sure. two stories, provide an example, maybe give details about, you know, what was the warehouse size, what kind of product they were selling, what was their aisle width and, you know, why it wasn't a good fit or why it was a good fit. So two stories, one good, one bad. 
Okay. Yeah. So I'll go with the bad first. Um, okay. And that, there's, and I've got a long list of those, but I'll stick to just one for this. Um, yeah. Really, I, I think the customer had, you know, once once you present robotics or they attend a a, a webinar or yeah. they, they the customer always feels that hey, I've got this one application that I'd like to start with. Yeah. You know, I've got this one application. I know I can automate it. Yeah. So so then we go through our validation, and typically we catch it early. So yeah. so you know, in a perfect world. We don't build hope or false hope. We then, we then kind of have that that very uh, frank conversation with the customer that hey, yep. here's the reason why we don't feel this is a great fit with our material handling robotics. Yeah. So, you know, and and one that comes to mind is this is a door manufacturer. So okay. so basically they they stack doors. Some are glass. Some are wood. Yeah. Uh, they are handled in various stages of the process, and they wanted a robotic lift truck to pick up uh, a non pat they, they somehow thought that they could palletize these odd shaped doors yeah and and have it in a consistent manner that a forklift could drive into the you know, a robotic forklift could yeah. could drive into that pallet and move these doors in that fashion and when you get to the site you know it actually went through various stages of the conversation and then we moved to an engineering study because we had a lot of questions. We get pictures ahead of time. We get all this type of stuff. And so we get to the site and yeah. their idea of palletizing doors is putting a pallet on the floor and stacking various doors up to about 10 high on a pallet. No yeah. straps, no straps, no yeah. securing, no securing of the doors. Yeah. Um, so, so then it brought in other elements of, okay, Here's the way it's going to happen. Here's the way it's going to pick up. And that could cause obviously more damage than a, a manual lift truck operator. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because the doors are unstable. They're top heavy. There's, there's different shapes and colors. They weren't all the same. So really, I think that was one that was a, a easy to call out and say, Hey, here's uh here, here's the reason why we cannot move forward. Um, okay. One, one, one other funny one, then I'll get to the good one. Uh, one of them actually had, one of them actually had a staircase. Okay. So, so obviously we make uh, robotic lift trucks that have wheels, right? Yeah. And and so we don't travel upstairs. There's no case, to my knowledge, that uh, one of our lift trucks has kind of gone up or down a flight of stairs. Yeah. And so, and now, now some of the customers obviously have ramps with various grades of slope, which is that that's okay if it falls within our truck specification. But this one customer wanted a their path of travel included a flight of stairs. So okay. that that was that was called out very early, yeah. and uh, and and we did not make a site visit in that case. Okay. So a, a, again, I think customers kind of go through in their in their mind that it's it's a very easy process or application to automate, and, and sometimes you have to kind of peel that onion back a, a few layers to kind of really yeah. get excited about it on, on the OEM side. From a uh, from a, a good perspective, there was a water sport or a, a good application. There was a water sports company. And yeah. uh, in, in this case, they had a operator that was, I'm a, I keep going back to a tow tractor, but uh, yeah. they had a tow tractor that was connecting to, on one side of their facility, they had order pickers that were going out, picking orders, putting them on trays that were on wheels, and then would place them in a staging area. Yeah. And they would link together. And then this, this operator would take a tow tractor, go pick them up about five at a time, if I remember correctly, and yeah. bring them back to the packing station where they yeah. actually package and ship. And that operator would then stand and chat with the, the order packers for let's yeah. say 10, 15 minutes, and then go back and repeat, repeat that process. And they had that going for two shifts. So roughly yeah. let's call it 16 to 20 hours of the day. They yeah. had an operator doing that. So in that product, really the productive time of that operator was, I'm going to, I'm going to, I think if I remember correctly, it was like 22, 22 minutes of the hour that operator was engaged with a load and moving something. Yeah. And the remaining time was dead. Yeah. So that to me, when you see this happen and they had multiple locations with that same application, you kind of yeah. look at it saying that that's not only a head count. But that's also going to expedite processes, reduce uh, other safety concerns and other things around the, the facility. So and, and the major reason that the customer liked the uh, like the solution was they felt that 
that person, that operator was pulling down both the order picking area and yeah. the packing stations due to the conversations and just uh, uh, interruptions during their, their business day. So hopefully that makes sense and, and it's pretty straightforward. But uh, those are the those are the goods and the bads. They do. And I am probably going to have a lot of follow up questions on these stories because they are super exciting for me personally, to be honest. OK, sure. so I can I can notice a couple of trends here. Right. Uh, if you look at the the bad ones, especially. So a couple of things that I noticed overall from the red flag perspective, and I don't know if I could spot all of them. So one of the, in the second one, in the second story, you mentioned the the flight of stairs, including that, right? So is, is that a red flag? Because, because this path is going to be difficult for a robot. Is that the reason why this is a bad example? So can you paint some more colors into what are going to be limitations of the robotic applications that exist today and why this example was a bad fit. Sure. I'll speak mainly on our, the, the, the fleet that I'm used to, right? Which we, okay. we, have an ars- we have an arsenal about, let's say, five to seven robots that we go to market with. The, the, the red flags would be, you know, inclines, declines greater than the truck specification. Okay. Um, I think wet floors are a no-go. So we, okay. we literally, uh, again, I'm just going at a high level, but these are the checklist boxes that we'd want to uh, either get excited over or eliminate the opportunity. Um, so we, we don't like un, non-consistent floor conditions, I yeah. guess is the pro- a better term to use. But you know, if there's wet floors, um, if, if it's a dirt goes into a dirt floor or some other means, so it's not the same consistency. Yeah. We don't go outdoors. So, so that's something that, you know, we, we don't go in an outdoor area. So it's mainly okay. in, inside of a manufacturing center, or inside of a distribution center, uh, okay. so inside the four walls. We do connect to uh, wireless networks. So we, we need that connectivity. Uh, you know, we, we have uh, natural navigation. So we, we, we need to know where we are at all times very frequently yeah. uh, so, so we can stay on track. Th- those are the major uh, hurdles. Load capacity is another big one, right? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, depending on the customer's load, uh, we may not have a automated automated lift truck or a robotic lift truck that is large enough to carry those loads or, or okay. carry the quantity they're looking for. You know, we, okay. we have a robotic uh, we have a robotic uh, in rider center rider that basically has the area to double stack pallets based upon their load. Uh, so you could technically carry four pallets at a time. So if you're going on these long horizontal runs. You know, that that could be a possibility. But let's say the customer wanted to take six or, yeah. you know, then, then we have to look at those throughputs and match the number of, you know, we, we have simulation and and various things that will match up to say, OK, we actually need two robots or three robots or to meet yeah. that desired uh, desired throughput. Very interesting. So I am actually going to touch on on these a little bit more just to understand, you know, where the limitations are. So let's say if we talk about wet floors, right, or the dirt floor, I would assume that that's probably not going to be very stable for the robot. And that could be the reason why you don't want to go for, let's say, wet floors. Uh, Are there any technology limitations or just because you are not going to get the same performance as you would uh, on the stable floor. So can you provide some more colors into yeah. why you don't like uh, wet floors or the dirt dirt conditions? Sure. So it, yeah, it's exactly what you said, but there's also other elements such as braking distance. You know, yeah. uh, it's easy to replicate a controlled in a controlled environment on a uh, on a stable floor the the braking distance and make sure we're in those ANSI regulations. I think once you go into an unknown environment or something that is uh, always changing, uh, then it's tough to kind of maintain those standards. Okay, so can you provide some more colors into wo- what is a braking distance? Because I don't know the the uh, listeners are going to be familiar with that. Uh, sure, is that sure. Some, some sort of regulatory term? What is that? Yes, so, so with the ANSI standards, they basically are going to want you to have proper distance. So you have object detection on these robots. So it's, yeah. let's just say there, there's a, uh, a laser coming out that's looking for something. And yeah. so, it, and they know the facility infrastructure, so they know the columns, the racks, and the, the permanent infrastructure. But when they see something that is not permanent, something that's not in their brain, they then, per ANSI regulations, need to have the proper distance to engage their brakes to come to a controlled stop. I so see. Not, not a slam on brakes. It's more of a controlled stop 
to, uh, to, to kind of a, a go there. And when you introduce wet floors or grease spills or, or some other uh, element that could come into play, that then can open the door for other risk and, and elements of, that are not in a safe environment. I see. And what kind of risks are, are going to be? Are the safety risks for the people that might be inside the facility? Or it could be just breaking off the robots or robots Correct. Uh, it, colliding it, with the products and breaking everything. What are we talking about here? Sure. sure. So so basically, it, it depends on the situation, right? So if okay. there, let's go back to the situation where I had four pallets, uh, two double stacked. Yeah. Um, if just like in a, in a, uh, a manned lift truck, if I'm driving okay. that forklift and I slam on brakes, there, if those loads aren't very stable, there is a high risk that those that could cause tip over, whether yep. side to side or pa- coming forward and, and hurting that manned uh, operator that's driving the lift truck. Yeah. Uh, if there's uh, if I don't slam on brakes or I slam on brakes and there's now a wet floor, that's now going to cause not only the pallets to move, but I could also slide and hit racking whatever's whatever objects are in front of me. So re- really, again. It's a tight process in, in a deployment and commissioning that we want to make sure that our robots are, are not only just like any other lift of material handling equipment. We want to make sure they're working in a safe environment up to our, our specification. OK, very interesting. So let's go back to your comment about the indoor versus outdoor. So are you guys not going outdoor because there are going to be more risk? overall the robots let's say colliding with the external properties and then you or the customer is going to run into the financial risk or are there technological uh, limitations uh, are they stopping you to go outdoors yeah t- typically we we don't go out for a, a number of reasons I, I guess yes one weather um so yeah. weather could cause potential you know with any type of uh system we, we don't have something that is uh completely weatherproofed from all okay. various elements yeah, uh, we, we are actually working uh, something I can bring up is we're working with a, a freezer, you know, so obviously within a warehouse, even in manufacturing, there's escalated heat and there is cold freezer, deep, deep store, deep freezer areas. So we're actually working on that as well. But with those additional elements come additional componentry and testing that comes in to make sure that you don't lose line of sight. So so the the various sensors that are on the truck need to understand if condensation comes yeah. into play and, and other things. So that, that kind of adds into that outdoor as well as extreme elements. Okay, amazing. So now I think I have a bit of understanding of, you know, it's always going to be the sort of the marriage of the uh, the product that they are trying to, let's say, uh, automate and the environment and the robots. I mean, everything has to be aligned uh, with the expectation. Otherwise, it's probably not going to work. So in your second story, there were a lot of factors related to the environment. In the first story, though, there were a lot of factors related to the product itself that the product needs to be slightly more standardized because the doors that you had in your first story, they were completely dissimilar, I guess, right? And that's what you said. So tell us a little bit more about the the product as well. In which situations it is going to be a fit, in which situations it is not going to be a fit. I know that you also mentioned the, the example about the weight of your product that, you know, you cannot go overboard. Uh, you cannot just kill the robot, I guess, you know, uh, by sure. overloading it. So weight is going to be one of the factor, but there are going to be other factors such as the the either the size or the dimensions that you mentioned in your first story. So can you talk a little bit about uh, the product as well? Sure, sure. So so we look for very consistent pallets, um, yeah. right? So we have to have consistent pallets. The forks, they're not going to adjust the fork uh, upon entry. So we need yep. to have very standardized uh, pallets. Something that's very interesting in the distribution space is we don't like to uh, co-mingle with, yep. with human operators. And, and, it, and it, first, I was very uh, didn't understand that concept. But then when you yep. go into a customer site, you understand that humans don't put the pallets away perfectly. So every distribution center you go into, there might be something off angle, off yep. you know more than two to three inches uh, left or right. And, yeah. and so really, when the robot goes to pick that pallet up, if, if it's beyond that, uh, that, that limitation or d- discretionary area, it's now going to error out and request somebody to come help it. You know, so, yeah. so really that there's a lot of uh, a, lo- a lot of environments there that, that could cause that. So so it's um, the, the pallets, the positioning of the pallets. You mentioned the load weight. 
The load weight yeah. is something that we like to keep within our truck specification. That's not only just in a robotic standpoint, but obviously on a manual standpoint as well. Uh, and and ma mainly because it could, again, you want it to operate it with that counterbalance, having the right amount of counterbalance to create a stable movement. You, you kind of want to make sure it's within the parameters of that specific truck and the engineering that went into that truck or robot. Yeah, so I completely agree with you, Kevin, overall with your assessment in terms of the standardization. And I think any technology that is going to be implemented is going to require some form of standardization. So now I am going to ask one more question related to our small to medium sized businesses customers. And I don't know if you guys work with small to medium sized businesses, but typically, let's say if you are looking at the traditional, uh, you know, medium size or the small distributor, they are not going to have their processes as standardized. I mean, their warehouses are going to be all over the place, uh, you know, overall in terms of the way they operate. I mean, they might not even have uh, a WMS system or the ERP system connected to their WMS, and they might yeah. not have these standardized any of the WMS process, whether you talk about your pick process, whether you talk about your pack process, right? So would you work with these small to medium sized businesses? Would you have any advice to correct their facility or the processes first before you would recommend them to introduce robots or would you not work with them at all? Sure. So, so we have small, medium, and large customers today, right? We have some okay. enterprise customers that continue to deploy, let's call them 40 to 50 robots at a time. Okay. And then we have some customers that have fully commissioned three robots and yeah. that has satisfied their need. Okay. So, so uh, again, I think we, we cover all ranges and, and what I would, I'll agree with you on the, on generally, but there are some outliers. I mean, there are some small companies that are very, very dialed in that goes back to, the who, whoever they've hired to engineer their facility, whoever yeah. they at whatever process they put in place in the general management of their facility. So that can maintain cleanliness amongst their aisles, amongst the standardization of their loads. And yeah. so all of these benefits come in, uh, come into that area. So I, I wouldn't, you know, obviously we have customers on from all different sizes. Um, yeah. I, I will say that if you have, if, you know, if, if you're a, a store or some other application that has a forklift in your back, uh, you know, your back area right now, and you're thinking of trying to automate whatever that forklift does, that's yeah. probably not the right mindset. It, it's really meant for, do you, we really go after what application, what are we trying to accomplish? We're not yeah. trying to, re, we're not just simply trying to replace a manual forklift with a robotic forklift. We're yeah. trying to look at a much larger scale picture to say, what is your desired throughputs? Can we do it? Can we do it uh, affordably? Can we do it at a way that would make sense to, you know, the, the, the benefits outweigh the, the cost and, 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 you know, your pros outweigh the cons and you kind of move forward with that solution. Um, and a lot of times you do from a, from a customer's perspective, we, we, I'm going back to an earlier question. There's, there's yeah. anxiety because you're, you're throwing all your eggs in a basket. You're putting all your <laughs> yeah. cash and, and you, you, that's a, that's something you, you either want with your name assigned to it or you don't. So I, I think in our case, what we do is we, we and I'm sure it's a common term in, in the robotic space is we a lot of yeah. times we go into a pilot and, and it's almost like a we've done it. So we've gone through the engineering study. We've gone through all the various checks and, and, and X's amongst. Will it make sense? We know the desired throughput. And then the pilot is we come in and we commission that robot or whether it's one to three robots or whatever it is. And, and you're basically as a company, we're proving it. Yeah. We're basically coming to you. We're, we're deploying these robots and saying, here's, you know, obviously there's a purchase order involved and, and you're buying it. But the guarantee is we're hitting whatever that contractual agreement states. Yeah. So we, we don't we don't just deliver them and, and kind of shake hands and walk off. We're there to commission the system. And, and typically there's there could be other uh, manual operated forklifts or other things that our, our independent dealers are, are servicing as well. So um, which leads to another a great point about uh, Yale is. You know, in many cases uh, in, in these robotics and automation space, uh, it, it's challenging. You know, the, the robots, the brilliant technology. I can't applaud various companies enough. But a lot of times what's lacking is possibly their service arm. So, yeah. so how do you maintain the robots? Do you have an existing, do you have to fly somebody here? And, and in our case, that, that's one of our big strengths is, is we've been in the material handling business for over 100 years. Yeah. Uh, we, we have over 5,000. I mean, we have a, a huge fleet of technicians with parts and, and various things that are trained in this robotic space. So as we deploy them, we already have that established that established service and parts network. The service readiness piece of it is in place. 
uh, which has been a huge benefit in, in, if, in all cases that we've gone into. Okay, amazing, Kevin. So that's it for today. Do you have any last minute closing thoughts or advice for our listeners? Sure, sure. We've gone through a lot today. And, and, and really, I think what, what I would close with is, is if, if, you're, if you're listening to this podcast and you have interest in robotics and automation and, and, you, and you're that person waving your flag going, I've got one, I've got an application I'd love to, uh, to investigate. I would highly encourage uh, you know, going, whether it be virtually or in person, meet with one of our, our dealers or one of our business development team members and physically seeing what our robots are capable of. You know, before you go two, two or three steps ahead, we do have virtual webinars. We, we have uh, test facilities that we invite customers to. So you can actually see uh, whether it's the robotic reach truck, the counterbalance stacker, the inrider, the tow tractor, you know, all, all these various uh, lift, lift trucks can be utilized and, and you can see it. So once you can see it, you can then visualize what it could do inside of your facilities with the various specifications, aisle widths, load capacities, et cetera. Uh, so, th- so that's step one. Make sure you, you work with a partner that's willing to show you that it's not a concept. We actually have deployed robots. We have you know, hundreds of deployed robots. And here's what we do on a day-to-day basis. I, th- I think the second piece is, is what I mentioned earlier, service. Make sure you understand not only the initial purchase, but maybe the, the back half of, of, of maintaining that robot. And then one thing I like to mention is financials. Don't look at it just as a CapEx project. You know, right? There's leasing options that have gained a lot of traction over the past three to five years. So you yeah. could actually, in the ROI, you know, if you, if you mentioned like, you know, a lot of high level employees are on this call, the yeah. ROI can be month one. You know, a lot of times there's about a 24 month period, I think is pretty acceptable in, in most business terms today. I want a 24 month, if I can't hit two years, I'm not in it. I, I think yeah. in our case, if you go through a leasing model with the residuals the way they are, you could literally hit month one and you're already creating that ROI. So uh, th- those are the challenges and, and the invites uh, and asks I would have for, for your audience. And I, I sincerely appreciate your time and, and would be happy to connect with anybody uh, in the future. Amazing. And my personal takeaway from this conversation is going to be, there's a lot out there overall in terms of automation of your facilities. So you can do a lot, uh, but make sure you are doing the research, you are understanding all of those red flags and you are not just creating the the bad experiences and thinking that you know what technology does not work uh, technology works as long as you are utilizing in the right setting in the right application on that note uh, kevin i really want to thank you for your time this was a powerful episode thank you so much i cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show for sharing their knowledge and journey i always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Kevin and Warehouse Robotics, head over to yale.com forward slash robotics. It's Y-A-L-E dot C-O-M forward slash R-O-B-O-T-I-C-S. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, You might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Tim Harrison, who discusses various ASRS systems and why they are essential to increase the productivity of a warehouse. Also, the interview with Chuck Coxhead from ProSensus, who discusses warehouse mobility trends in the enterprise and SMB markets. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you. And I hope to get you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.